people of God, I invite you to stand as you are able and join in singing our congregational introit. Sing a new song. People of God, please join me in our call to worship found in your bulletin adapted from Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high? Who looks far down? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. The Lord is high above all nations, his glory above the heavens. Let us praise the Lord. People of God, we sing our opening hymn. It's found in the very front of your hymnals, that P section, P5, How Great Thou Art.
people of God, please join me in our prayer of invocation printed in your bulletin. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for all of your good gifts to us. Here in this place, we gather again to hear the stories, to remember who we are and to whom we belong. In our songs and our prayers, move among us today. By your Spirit, shape us into a people who will carry your compassion to a hurting world. Hear us, O oh God, as we pray together in the words of Jesus Christ, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. People of God, hear this good news. Whatever we bring with us to this place this morning, whatever burdens we carry, whether they be anger or disappointment, distraction or worry, resentment or fear, whatever the house looked like when we walked out the door this morning, whatever we have done or left undone, whatever old wounds we bear, God desires to meet us here in this place with grace because God loves us just the way we are. God loves you just the way you are. And from those places that cry out for transformation and healing, from the weight of those burdens, God calls us forth. God calls us outside ourselves into trust, into community, into worship. God calls us forth with a promise beyond our wildest imaginings of what we might be because while God loves us just the way we are, God loves us too much to let us stay that way. Trusting God to transform the things that do not serve us anymore, we lean into the promise that calls us forth. Let us sing our thanks to God for this promise and this grace. So last week, we began our journey with the narrative lectionary. It is a journey that will walk us through scripture from beginning to end this year. We start in Genesis. Genesis contains what we might call our origin stories. Last week, the very beginning of Genesis, Adam and Eve, and the question of the nature of the human condition. This week, still in Genesis, we have before us the question of the nature and conditions of and for faith. Our reading today is from the 15th chapter of the book of Genesis. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, 
your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no offspring, and and so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. No one but your very own issue shall be your heir. God brought Abram outside and said, Look toward the heaven and count the stars if you are able to count them. Then God said to him, So shall your descendants be. And Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. Holy wisdom, holy word, thanks be to God. Our worship this morning continues with song. I would like to invite all of our third graders to come up to the front with me. Church, this is a very special day because it's a day we get to celebrate in a milestone of our children's education here at church. Today is the day that our third graders receive their very own Bible.
All right, my friends, open up your Bible. Look inside the front cover. So you'll notice in there a special piece of paper. I've signed it. Matt has signed it. It has today's date. But the top line might be most important because that's where I want you to sign your name. And when we sign our name to something, it gives us ownership. As soon as you sign your name in this Bible, it belongs to you for your whole life. And this Bible looks very, very nice and brand new, doesn't it? I'll give you a play-by-play because you're sitting far away. It's a nice hardcover red Bible that we use here at church. And inscribed at the bottom it says, you are a child of God. So when I ask you in a few years if I can see your Bible, and I might do that, this is what I want it to look like. I want it to be roughed up. I want to open the pages and I want to see writing in it and doodles. Because this is part of your relationship with God. And our relationship with God isn't perfect like this book. Sometimes it is. Sometimes we don't touch it for a while. Sometimes it gets really rough, and sometimes you have questions. Well, I want this book, this Bible, to be with you in all times of your life. The good times, the not-so-good times, the times that you're worried. Open it up. It will give you peace. Before I have you sit down today, let's open up the front cover And let's read that blessing together. Do you see it? Good job. Help your friend if they need it. Perfect. Here we go. May our hands and minds get lost and found in these stories, teachings, and wonderings. May our Bibles guide us as we grow in love of God, ourselves, and our neighbors. Amen. Let's give them a round of applause for this milestone. Of course, children are always welcome in worship. We also offer some wonderful opportunities for our young, growing minds. Of course, child care is open, and we invite all children three years through sixth grade to attend church school. The time is now. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the worship of God here at Plymouth Church, the half of you who are left. <laughs> You'll have to pass the message on. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, friends, you are always welcome here. A special welcome to you if you are visiting with us for the first time this morning or if you find yourself in search of a church home. We're so glad you decided to join us for worship. We hope that you'll feel right at home. One good way for us to start getting acquainted with one another is for those of you seated nearest the inside aisle to get the red friendship pad moving. It's a good way to learn the names of your neighbors in the pew. We'll have lots of time to get acquainted after worship in Waveland Hall. That's just down the hall to my left and your right. If you are visiting with us this morning, you can head out the doors nearest me and you'll be right on track to check in with the visitors table. A really nice person is there waiting to welcome you and answer any questions you may have about life at Plymouth. Again, welcome. We're so glad you're here. You know, Jesus taught us that the two most important things we can do in this life are to love God and to love other people. And so our mission as a church is to grow in love of God and neighbor. That sounds simple, but it's not always easy. We don't grow in love just because we agree that it sounds like a good idea. Um, No, growth means change. It means taking a risk and trying something new. The current happenings insert in your bulletin is a guide to a lot of the ways, not all, but a lot of the ways, we're growing in love together as a congregation. I invite you to find this. Take it home. Take it home with you. Spend some time and consider how you might be called to take a risk and to grow in love, too. The one thing I want to lift up this morning is our farmer's market. We are going to have a local farmer's market here at church from 5 to 7 today. So tonight, Sunday night, on the upper level of the parking deck. This is an experiment. It's a complete experiment to see whether we might like to have a farmer's market at Plymouth on an ongoing basis. 
So if that sounds like an interesting idea to you, if you'd like a church farmer's market sometime in the future, come check it out. Lend your support. We're going to have some outstanding local vendors. There'll be live music, Uncle Wendell's barbecue, fancy ice cream. What? You can make it a dinner date. There it is. Plan for tonight, 5 to 7. More about that and a lot more in your current happenings. All of that comes later. Right now, we're in worship together. And so I invite you to set these things aside. Be here now as we prepare for worship through a time of prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray, first in the intimacy of silence.
God of grace, one way or another, we're all here this morning because of you. Some of us long for a word from you like water in a parched land. And some of us came because someone else thought it was a good idea. A lot of us aren't entirely sure what brought us here when we really stop and ask the question. But however it happened, one way or another, we came here because of you. Because this is one place we know to look for you. We know you tend to show up here in a way that we recognize, and we count on that. And so we came, partly for our own reasons and partly for yours. God, help us trust that our intentions don't matter nearly as much as yours. Help us trust that you are the one who comes alongside us and nudges us into the ways that lead to life. No matter how sideways we get or how messed up we make things, God, you are with us, calling us beloved and calling us home. And so we pray that you would take the mixed up offering of our worship, our distractions, our doubts, our resentments, our suspicions, our earnestly held desires and, and our deepest longings. God, receive the offering of ourselves just as we are, and love us into that new life. Kick us in the pants and kiss us on the lips. Hold our hands and draw us closer to the life you believe it is in us to live. And God, together with our brother and sister churches on Peace and Justice Sunday, we ask a special blessing on all those whose life work it has been to make peace and to stand for justice. The arc of the universe is so long, so long, and yet we trust that it does bend toward peace and justice. We trust that the lives dedicated in service to peace are vital to your work in our world. And we pray that those who demand justice in our community, in our nation, and in the world will finally prevail. God, we long to see it so, and we pray for the strength and for the courage to join with them, to join with a long line of peacemakers and justice seekers, adding our time and our talents and our treasures to their work so that the day may dawn sooner when all our children are safe. And there's enough for all and dignity attends each and every life. God, we are bold to pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, as you turn in the hymnal to hymn 296, you might want to know that there is a refrain that repeats once, and just to see if you're paying attention, it repeats in Hebrew, <laughs> but it's pretty simple, so the mountains will lead us and we'll try to follow along.
Amen. Beloved, this morning as we continue exploring this year's theme of compassion, I'd like to place a tag on this message from which I shall attempt to preach as the Spirit shall guide. I'd like to preach from this thought, compassion for fatigued faith. Compassion for fatigued faith. Let us pray. God, we thank you for the opportunity to once again be in this place and join together in worship. We do indeed need you to open our ears and our souls to receive what you might have for us today. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy and acceptable in thy sight. For you, O oh God, are our strength, and without a doubt, you are our Redeemer. In the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. Compassion for fatigued faith. Beloved, who are you when no one is around? I know you look good on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Fantastic, if I do say so myself. <laughs> but tonight, long after you left this place, after the songs have been sung, after the prayers have been uttered, after friends and fellow churchgoers have been greeted, who will you be when no one is around? Is it all right if I get heavy this morning? See, I have a funny feeling and a sneaky suspicion that often when we make the decision to get out of bed each morning, some of us also make the calculation what to bring out to the world and what to leave at our doorsteps. Perhaps we leave the dreams that we've had to put on hold. Perhaps we leave a family issue that we just can't deal with until the end of the day. Perhaps we even leave some, some questions about the world, about ourselves, and even God. Questions that often we may even feel guilty for having. And so perhaps we leave them at our doorsteps, reluctantly retrieving them when we come back wherever we lay our heads at night. And so I ask the question one more time, who are you, beloved, when no one is around? And that right there is really where we find ourselves in our text this morning. You see, there is this man by the name of Abram. You may know him better by what his name is changed to, Abraham. But after the creation story that we heard last week, if you keep on reading, you'll discover that the saga that is the relationship between God and creation continues. It continues past Cain and Abel. It continues through Noah and the flood. It continues past the Tower of Babel. And the saga continues and lands at the foot of this man named Abram. And in Genesis 12, God tells Abram to go away from everything he knows because God is going to show him a land where he and his family and his offspring will be made great. Fast forward to chapter 14. And Abram goes on this secret surprise rescue mission to rescue his nephew Lot 
who's been captured. He succeeds in this mission, and his success benefits several kings in the area. And this sets Abram up to receive handsome compensation for his troubles. And here's the critical part of the story, beloved. In chapter 14, Abram rejects the wealth he's offered by these kings. And he says he'd rather his wealth be attributed to God. Abram, in front of kings and royalty, in front of a crowd of impressed onlookers, says in essence, I don't need anything you have because God's got me. And in the text that Leanne read for us this morning, that same Abram that publicly stood flat-footed privately laments that this same God doesn't seem to hold up his end of the bargain. It's almost like in public, beloved Abram can say, God is good. But then when he realizes that he's been on a journey that doesn't make sense, a journey that has been marked by more unfulfillment than fruition, Abram gets alone and asks the question, is God good? And I'm no doctor, beloved, but I'd like to diagnose Abram this morning as having fatigued faith. That's when one might hear a word from God or believe God will do something, and we hold on to that belief only to find ourselves one day lamenting when it's nowhere in sight. But I just believe that God does a few things in this text rooted in compassion to address Abram's fatigued faith and hopefully speak a word to us who may have walked in this morning feeling like Abram. Here's the first thing that God does, beloved. The first thing that God does is God addresses and does not condemn Abram's doubt. You see, if you read closely, after his rescue mission succeeds in chapter 14, Abram never articulates out loud his fear that God's promise won't come through. And yet at the beginning of chapter 15, God acknowledges the unarticulated fear and says, do not be afraid. Don't miss that, beloved. Abram does not say out loud that he's struggling. But before he can say anything, God steps in and says, do not be afraid. And what follows is amazing, but for me, the fact that God does not lead off with condemnation, and the fact that God does not berate Abram, instead, God knows that as tough and flat-footed as Abram is on the outside, there are some questions lingering on the inside. And it's almost as if God gives Abram permission to let it all out. Because as soon as God says, do not be afraid, Abram begins to list all the reasons he has no reason to believe God anymore. But God doesn't get angry, beloved. God doesn't call Abram ungrateful. And I would suggest that God understands. Because the reality is that sometimes God doesn't make sense. Sometimes. Even though it's the place we know that we need to be, it's hard to come to worship. And sometimes we're tired of pretending 
like we're okay with not knowing what God is up to. But the beauty of this passage, beloved, is that it teaches us that when we're experiencing fatigued faith, God in his compassion will welcome our honesty and will not dismiss it. Not only does God compassionately respond to Abram's fatigued faith by addressing his doubt and not condemning it, but also God addresses Abram's specific fear. Please watch the text, beloved, because after Abram opens up the floodgates, and lets God know all of his fears, he really lets God know the core fear that he's dealing with. He fears that he won't have offspring to pass his possessions to. In fact, he specifically fears, as the customs of his day would oblige him to, to pass it on to Eliezer a slave born in his house. Now, in no way am I nor can I invite us to ignore the injustice happening to Eliezer in this text. But I also invite you to see that for Abram, in his eyes, he's confused how God can make a promise and after all that he's been through, it not happened the way that God said it would. And beloved, the most amazing thing happens because God not only responds to Abram's question, but he addresses Abram's specific fear. See, Abram specifically asks about Eliezer and God answers his specific question. Now that may not mean much to you, but have you ever asked someone a question and, they, and in their answer, they answer everything but your question? See, I see compassion flowing throughout this text, flaws and all, when Abram comes to God with fatigued faith and God answers what he's asking about. The reason why that's good news, beloved, is that there are so many places in our lives, in our communities, and our world, where people are answering questions that no one is asking. And God's model of compassion teaches us that we ought to be answering the questions that people are asking. How about we actually answer the question and cries for justice in sexual assault cases instead of giving answers or asking more questions that re-victimize survivors? How about we actually answer questions and cries for justice for a living wage instead of giving excuses that don't acknowledge the lived reality of those living at the margins. Beloved, how about we actually answer the question and cries for environmental justice instead of just shaking our heads at the symptoms of polluted air, lead poisoned water supplies, and food deserts in communities in poverty. Beloved, I just believe that God shows us what compassion looks like by hearing Abram's fears and his underlying questions. And he doesn't skirt around the issues. He answers the questions that Abram puts on the table. God compassionately responds to Abram's fatigued faith by addressing and not condemning his doubt. It is in compassion that God also addresses Abram's specific fear. But here's the last point that I'll make, beloved. It is in compassion 
that God takes it all a step further and shows Abram what he needs to see. You see, God answers Abram's question, and then he takes him outside and shows him the stars in the sky. As innumerable as the stars are in the sky, God says, in essence, so will your descendants be. Abram takes a look at the sky, and the next verse says that he believed. And beloved, I'd like to submit that God shows Abram what he needs to see in order to address his fatigued faith. It may not have worked for me, may not have worked for you. Perhaps it may not even have worked for his wife, Sarai. But God has a way of showing us exactly what we need to see when we're struggling with fatigued faith to keep us going, even when the path is not always clear. Let me see if I can put it this way. Um, this summer, I had the awesome opportunity uh, to join the angelic voices of the Matins Choir on tour uh, as they went to Colorado. Can we give them a round of applause? They keep me young. They keep me young. Um, and it was a fantastic time of incredible fellowship. Um, had a great time with the chaperones who were on tour. Um, and even though they sing these anthems, amazing, believe me, beloved, you haven't heard anything until you've heard the matins on a karaoke machine. <laughs> Shout out to DJ Joe. Shout out to DJ Joe. The matins finished up their tour in Estes Park, but I had to fly back to the East Coast to attend my ordination services. And I don't know if they could tell, but for most of the week, I was incredibly nervous. See, it is a momentous occasion in the life of a minister to be ordained, and I don't always feel like I fully know what God is calling me towards. But here I was getting ready to leave, and before we go our separate ways, Susan Waller, the director of the choir, pulls me aside and says, David, before you leave, the Matins need to do a blob of blessing. And so I kid you not, beloved, there we are in the middle of Boulder, Colorado, downtown, and a crowd of about 65 Matins or so on a sidewalk that is far too small for all of us get together and in the middle of the chaos cars slowing down to figure out what's going on these matins surround me and pronounce a blessing as I make my way they hand me a, a bracelet that I still wear to this day and in that moment beloved I still had my questions the whole journey wasn't revealed to me but just like when God showed Abram the stars, God showed me that she's got me even in the middle of my fatigued faith. See, I, I'd like to tell you that, that the story is perfect after Abram sees the stars, but it's not. Abram doesn't get it after this encounter. He, he continues to mess up time and time again. And unfortunately, Abram goes on to harm some of the people around him in the process, like his wife, like Eliezer, like a woman by the name of Hagar, and their son Ishmael. But God not only hears their cries, God also doesn't stop showing compassion to Abram, even in his brokenness. And so, beloved, I came to speak a word of life to someone in this place. I don't know where you are today. Perhaps 
Fatigued faith has made it so that when you are alone, you're like many of us wondering what God is up to. But please know that, that God has compassion for all of us. Compassion that doesn't run out. Compassion that understands, can meet, and rejuvenate our fatigued faith. Thanks be to God. If you're in this place, one of the ways that we can respond to that type of love, that type of compassion, is by giving. We give not only out of gratitude for God's compassion, but also to sow into a family of faith like Plymouth, determined to show that same type of compassion coupled with justice out in the world. It is in that spirit that I invite us to give.
God, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity to share these gifts, a small sign of our gratitude for your compassion. We pray that these gifts will support ministries like all of our choirs that lead us in worship and so faithfully remind us of your love for us. May they support ministries like the Stephen ministers that journey with us through our darkest moments. May these resources support initiatives like Amos, opportunities for us to model compassion and justice in this community and beyond. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for your love. In Christ's name we pray, amen. And so, beloved, I invite you to go out and live boldly, knowing that you aren't the only one that every now and then has questions. Know that the God of justice and power, the God that holds the stars in the heavens, the God of compassion holds you and loves you now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>